Development of what would eventually become the iconic P-38 Lightning began years before America entered the Second World War, featuring distinctive twin booms and a stubby cockpit nacelle protruding from a large one-piece wing. The single-seat twin-engine machine was Lockheed's response to a United States Army Air Corps proposal for a uniquely new long-range fighter. Thanks to their speed, reliability, and versatility, P-38s ultimately served as fighter bombers, pathfinders, night fighters, and long-range escorts. Often referred do as fork tail devils by Luftwaffe pilots. Most were packed with cannons and heavy machine guns, though some were dedicated reconnaissance versions with cameras installed instead of weapons. In fact, Lightnings were so successful in this role that they were responsible for capturing approximately 90% of the ground photographs taken from the skies over Europe. In addition, P-38s were among the first American fighters constructed almost exclusively of smooth aluminium and stainless steel skin sections joined with flush-mounted rivets, which significantly improved aerodynamics. P-38s were also arguably the first military aircraft to fly faster than 400 miles per hour, 640 kilometers an hour in level flight, and were the United States' primary long-range fighter until the introduction of P-51D Mustangs. In early 1937, the United States Army Air Corps expressed interest in a new multi-role aircraft that would need to have a top speed in excess of 360 miles per hour, 580 kilometers an hour, and be capable of climbing to 20,000 feet in less than six minutes. From engineering and performance standpoints, these specs alone were among the toughest ever proposed. At the time, Lockheed was a relatively small company with limited big project experience, and as such, executives and designers weren't sure they'd be able to give the US USAAC what they wanted using conventional aircraft engines. Thankfully, they got help from two visionary Air Corps insiders who weren't above twisting the rules to their advantage. An unlikely alliance was formed, and to cut through the stifling red tape, the collaborators relied on semantics to get the airplane of their dreams, a powerful twin-engine thoroughbred capable of carrying lots of weapons and excelling in a variety of combat roles. Well, the aircraft's official mission would be intercepting enemy aircraft at high altitudes. Today, we'd probably call the P-38 an interceptor, but at the time, this was a relatively uncommon term, and the plane was ultimately designed as a pursuit aircraft, hence the P in P-38. That said, doing away with the old pursuit moniker in favor of the interceptor designation meant that the sky was the proverbial limit for this new warbird. Thanks to stodgy military regulations, pursuit aircraft were subject to a number of annoying restrictions, namely that single-seaters were relegated to having just one engine and limited to carrying 500 pounds of weapons, excluding guns and ammunition. But even with the bureaucratic hurdles clear, the major problem of getting two engines and a cockpit into a reasonably aerodynamic airframe remains. The Lockheed team chose twin booms to accommodate the tail assemblies, engines, and turbo superchargers with a central nacelle housing the pilot and armament. Though it had already been used in the Luftwaffe's Fokker Wolf FW-189 reconnaissance aircraft and later on the Northrop P-61 Black Widow night fighter, the resulting configuration was rare. Lockheed designers incorporated a stable and compact tricycle undercarriage, a bubble canopy for good visibility, and two 1,100-plus horsepower 12-cylinder Allison V1710 engines fitted with counter-rotating propellers, which cancelled out engine torque that had a tendency to pull the aircraft off to the side at full throttle. Initial prototypes had propellers that turned inward toward one another, but later versions featured outward-spinning props that made the plane much more stable and efficient. The all-important turbo supercharger which allowed the engines to breathe normally despite low oxygen levels at high altitudes were positions in the boom behind each engine. In addition to providing unparalleled performance, they also muffled engine noise significantly. In the summer of 1937, Lockheed began building two prototypes, XP-38 and YP-38, the first example of which took to the air in January of the following year. Just a month later, long before inherent design kinks had been identified and addressed, Chief Test Pilot Ben Kelsey proposed a brash marketing gimmick that would ultimately solidify interest in orders 
for the new airplane. Kelsey would fly the untested plane from Southern California to Long Island, New York, ostensibly for further testing, though it was really all about showing off the 38's impressive performance. Keen on thrusting their unproven interceptor onto the national aviation stage, Lockheed executives gave Kelsey the proverbial nod, and shortly thereafter the daring pilot fired up the Allisons and headed east. Kelsey flew conservatively in the early going, but as he became more comfortable with the aircraft, he began pushing it to its limits, eventually reaching 420 miles per hour, 680 kilometers an hour in level flight, just above 20,000 feet. Not counting stops for refueling, the nearly 2,900 mile flight took just seven hours and two minutes. Nearing its destination at Mitchell Field in Hampstead, New York, however, one of the engines experienced a carburetor failure, and Kelsey was forced to make a rough, unpowered landing. Both pilots and blades survived, but despite the embarrassing last minute accident, the Air Corps was sufficiently impressed to order more than a dozen additional aircraft for approximately 135,000 US dollars each, or about $2.2 million in today's money. Though ecstatic with the new order, Lockheed's manufacturing facilities and personnel just really weren't up to the task of filling it, and they fell hopelessly behind schedule almost immediately. Not only were the new twin-boom twin-engine planes painstakingly slow to build, but the Air Corps requested a number of modifications that added to the manufacturing woes. Lockheed eventually expanded its Burbank plant and got back on track, but the next aircraft wouldn't roll off the production line until 1940. Though relatively small by twin-engine standards, P-38s had wingspans of 52 feet, that's 15.8 meters, empty weights of 12,800 pounds, 5,800 kilograms, and a maximum takeoff weight of greater than 21,000 pounds, or about 7,900 kilos. Over the aircraft's life, successive versions enjoyed big bumps in horsepower from the trusty Allison V-12s, which eventually thumped out more than 1,600 horsepower at 3,000 RPM. Coupled with their three-blade Curtis constant speed propellers, P-38s could easily cruise at 275 miles per hour, that's 443 kilometers an hour, with standard weapons and fuel loads. Combat range was a hearty 1,300 miles, 2,100 kilometers, and they had a service ceiling of 44,000 feet, and could accompany high-altitude bombers to and from distant targets that were well out of reach of other escorts of the day. Now officially designated the P-38, in its various forms, the new plane had either two or four 50 caliber Browning machine guns and a cannon between 20 and 37 millimeters that together could spew out more than 3,000 rounds per minute, though pilots typically fired in very short bursts. The total duration of sustained cannon fire was approximately 14 seconds, while the 50 caliber machine guns were capable of firing continuously for about 35 seconds with 500 round magazines. Roughly one in 20 projectiles was a cannon shell and unlike most U.S. aircraft that sported wing-mounted guns, the P-38s were clustered in the nose. With the former setup, guns had to be aimed slightly inwards, often at multiple convergence points ahead of the aircraft. Since they fired at an angle, the projectiles didn't bore straight into the onrushing air, which in turn meant that range was significantly limited. On the flip side, P-38 guns could often down enemy aircraft from as far away as a thousand yards since they always fired directly ahead. In addition, P-38s, like the L variant, had strengthened hardpoints that could support up to 2,000 pounds, that's 900 kilograms of bombs. When approaching Mach 0.7, or about 535 miles an hour, or 861 kilometers an hour, which lightnings could easily do when diving, their tails often shook violently, and their noses had a tendency to automatically tuck under, further steepening the descent. If the pilot was unable to climb or turn his way out of the dive, the plane would sometimes enter a high-speed compressibility stall in which the controls became hopelessly locked and unresponsive. The unlucky aviator would then have to decide whether to bail out or to remain with the aircraft until it reached denser air, where the likelihood of regaining control increased. Another early prototype issue with P-38s was that they weren't equipped to carry drop tanks. This wasn't a glaring oversight, but rather the result of prevailing Air Corps ideology, which asserted that the development of true long-range fighters was too time-consuming and expensive. Therefore, limited resources were better used refining and manufacturing existing aircraft, though they were far from perfect for 
the roles which they were being used for. However, Lockheed was eventually tasked with adding drop tank hardpoints, and they ultimately became standard on G models and later aircraft, which greatly improved their endurance and performance on long-range escort and photo reconnaissance missions. Another flaw that constantly irked pilots was an atrocious climate control system. Especially in the winter, flyers in the European theater put up with absolutely freezing cockpit temperatures at high altitudes, while in the tropics, conditions were often intolerably hot. In Europe, pilots often dressed like Arctic explorers, while in the Pacific, they typically wore little more than shorts, t-shirts, sandals, and a parachute. The first Lightning saw service in mid-1942, both in reconnaissance and pursuit variants. More than two dozen were sent to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, where their speed and range made them well suited to missions over large expanses of open water. Though they performed well, the harsh weather was responsible for far more losses than mechanical issues or enemy aircraft. In fact, it was surprisingly common for Lightning pilots to simply lose awareness of their surroundings on long flights, become mesmerized and disoriented, and simply fly into the water. In early August of 1942, nearing the end of a 1,000-mile patrol, two P-38s from the 343rd Fighter Group inadvertently stumbled across two Japanese Kawanishi H-6K Mavi flying boats. So, unmaneuverable and lightly armored, the planes were easy picking. And though they were the first to be shot down by lightnings, thousands more would follow in the years to come. P-38s were used most extensively in the Pacific in a variety of roles, but primarily escorting bombers at altitudes between 18,000 and 25,000 feet. While they couldn't outmaneuver A6M0s and most other Japanese fighters at low altitudes or below 200 miles per hour, the Lightning's superior speed, climb rate, and high altitude performance meant that when used correctly by trained pilots, they were more than a match for their smaller and more nimble adversaries. In addition, their tightly grouped guns were even more deadly to lightly armored Japanese warplanes than Germany. German ones because the former weren't equipped with self-sealing fuel tanks. Utilizing his centrally mounted guns with deadly effects, the United States' highest scoring World War II air race Dick Bong scored 40 air-to-air -air kills in P-38s. Linings established local air superiority early on in the war over the Pacific, but though commanders frequently requested more, new planes were increasingly sent to Europe, which was considered a higher priority. In early March 1943, in one of the theater's most notable engagements, a flight of P-38s were escorting 13 B-17s when five Japanese Zeros burst onto the scene. One bomber was immediately downed, but though the crew bailed out, each was strafed while drifting down in their parachutes, a serious breach of etiquette among airmen. As the story goes, fueled with adrenaline, spite, and a lust for vengeance, three P-38s peeled off and within just a few minutes dispatched all five zeros. After hundreds of sorties with no enemy contact, dozens of P-38s originally sent to the remote corners of Europe were eventually reassigned to North Africa in late 1942. The first kill took place in late November, when young Lieutenant Mark Shipman downed an unspecified twin-engine Italian plane, most likely a transport or reconnaissance aircraft. Shipman would make more impressive kills later on against a Messerschmitt Bf 109 fighter and a huge Me 323 Gigant transport, but early results around North Africa and the Mediterranean were a bit mixed. A number of pilots quickly became aces, but many more were shot down, not necessarily due to limitations of their machines, but because they failed to use tactics that capitalized on the aircraft's strengths. Over North Africa, Italy, and the Mediterranean, P-38s primarily served as long-range bomber escorts. Early doctrine dictated that P-38s stick close to the bombers they were escorting instead of peeling off and defending them proactively. As a result, many pilots were knocked out before they had the opportunity to exploit their machines to the fullest. As losses mounted and morale plummeted, Air Corps brass eventually gave them the green light to take the fight to the enemy, after which losses dropped off and the kill ratio once again swung firmly to the American side. Later on, however, as Allied bombing missions in the region became less frequent, P-38s were assigned ground and maritime attack missions. Though they excelled at each, at low levels while dispatching tanks, trucks, subs, and ships, they were particularly vulnerable to attack from above, and later some dedicated fighters were reserved for circling overhead to deter would-be attackers.
Though P-38s aren't generally associated with D-Day, they did act as fighter bombers over Normandy as Allied soldiers and equipment poured onto the continent in epic numbers. Aircrafts from multiple fighter groups based in England flew missions against radar installations, coastal fortifications, flag towers, and armored troop concentrations prior to the assault on June 6. Along with Spitfires and later P-51s, P-38s also escorted 8th Air Force heavy bombers to and from missions over Germany and occupied France. Especially in the air war over Europe, it was also discovered that P-38s were much less likely to be mistakenly downed by friendly aircraft whose pilots mistook them for enemy planes. In addition to its performance and reliability, it was largely for this reason that the 8th Air Force Commander, Lieutenant General Jimmy Doolittle, chose to personally fly a P-38 during the Normandy invasion. Doolittle later claims that of all the warbirds he'd ever flown, the P-38 was the sweetest flying plane in the sky. All told, more than 10,000 Lightnings were built in nearly 20 distinct variants. By war's end, they'd flown hundreds of thousands of sorties in nearly every theater. Many of America's top aces scored many or all of their kills in P-38s, and though other aircraft had more total air-to-air -air victories, Lightnings were credited with destroying more Japanese aircraft than any other fighter of the war. Today, more than two dozen P-38s survive. Most are in museums in the United States, and a few of them still fly regularly. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.